Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> um, so today's talk is going to uh, report on the economic impact of, of Brookhaven National Lab. But before that, I'm also going to comment on the overall economic uh, prospects for the island uh, because these are interrelated things. So maybe uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> uh, part of what I do with the LIA is I write a monthly newsletter on econo economic conditions on Long Island. And uh, I focus on uh, labor markets, business conditions, uh, various sectors, and report on what the latest news is. Uh, and this has been going on for a long time, that uh, the Long Island labor market's been very strong. Uh, in April, the unemployment rate was 3%, which is the lowest level in almost two decades for April. The number of persons employed was the highest ever. Uh, the private job, job sector count uh, increased between March and April by 15,500, which was in excess of the norm of 13,000. So all of those uh, numbers are positive. Next slide, please. And the big gainers, and this has been going on for some time, education and health services in terms of jobs gained, 10,600 jobs gained year over year. Uh, manufacturing is doing reasonably well, 1,600. And then natural resources mining uh, and construction, 5,500. Next, please. Uh, now, wages, of course, are another bit of another story. Uh, we have New York State data um, <clears throat> that's up to date. Uh, and for the state, hourly, earn hourly earnings increased by 2.3%, which is about keeping pace with inflation. Um, and it varied a lot by industry. So some industries had much larger gains, 4.4, 5.8 uh, in manufacturing. Uh, every sector had did it have, have a gain in hourly earnings. Now, when you adjust for inflation, if inflation is about 2%, a sector that had gains of 1%, that means the real spending value, spending power of the wage is actually declining. Um, and people have been wondering why with such a tight labor market, we haven't seen more robust wage growth. And I think uh, it has to do with the measure of unemployment. So the popular measure we have for unemployment, which we typically report on, is called U3. But U3, excludes some people who might reasonably consider, be considered unemployed, uh, such as people who are discouraged workers and they, they exit the labor force. Okay? Under U3, they're not counted as unemployed. Or if they have a part-time job but they want a full-time job, again, under U3, they're not counted as unemployed. So it means that there's been a residual group of people who could reasonably be argued as unemployed that we've been able to tap into as we hire more. And until that's exhausted, we're probably not going to see higher wage gains. So uh, at least that's uh, uh, something I read uh, by uh, someone in the New York Times, and I agreed with him. So, <laughs> next slide, please. Uh, so business conditions, especially small business, is important to track on Long Island because Long Island is really uh, about small business. 90% of establishments on Long Island are small businesses. And that's second in the state only to the New York City area. So as small business goes, so goes Long Island. And uh, one of the surveys we track is the NFIB Small Business Optimism Index. Unfortunately, this doesn't just pertain to Long Island. Uh, it's an overall assessment. This is the best data we have. But um, uh, in April, Optimism remained at historically high levels. Business optimism, of course, is important because business op optimism means investment in jobs. And nearly every component of the index showed an increase um, from March. 18% growth in plans, the percent of respondents who um, plan to increase employment, 27% planning to make capital outlays. So there's increased, it's going to be increased investment and increased employment. And pretty much everything, uh, everything has uh, shown some gains. Next slide, please. Now, there's also another in index we track is the uh, Empire State Manufacturing Index. And this gives us an overall view of manufacturing in New York State. Um, and the latest reading uh, from this is the May uh, uh, index, I guess, uh, which has um, climbed a lot to 17.8, which uh, means it's strong. And you can see the pattern. Uh, we had, had a dip in uh, 
late uh, 2018. We seem to be rebounding from that, uh, although not quite at the highest levels we saw over the past couple of years. But it seems to be moving again in the right direction. Next slide, please. Uh, the other sector we track is the uh, service sector, of course, uh, and that we look at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's business leader survey. And uh, the latest results were at its highest level in several months. Um, the business climate component rose nine points, so to 10.7, and that number means on balance uh, firms are optimistic about economic, economic conditions in the service sector. So we have, we have um, uh, basically overall good performance in terms of manufacturing and service sector. Next slide, please. I'll go over here. But there are a number of challenges. I'll just talk briefly about three. Uh, I didn't put in the XXX. I had, uh, that was a, a typo. Um, but um, these are some estimates that my colleague uh, Seth Foreman uh, provided. And uh, uh, the number was, in the, in the, I, I think it's the number is like 25 million a week. Okay? But I, I can't uh, swear to that. But uh, sorry, I apologize, that number's not there. Uh, but the partial shutdown was a threat. It was a concern. We thought it would, we thought it would ruin first quarter growth. And actually, it didn't, which was a surprise. First quarter GDP grew at a solid rate. Uh, proposed interest rate hikes. This was another thing. The Fed was going to keep raising interest rates. Uh, and that's a threat to home purchases and business investment. And it also rattles the stock market. Okay? But that seems to have gone away. And then we have the third thing, the threat of a trade war with China, which I thought had finally gone away. But it just keeps ebbing and flowing. And now it seems to be back with us again. And this is having. Uh, significant negative impacts on the stock market, and that translates into consumer confidence and consumer spending. And the consumer spending sector of the economy is 70% of the GDP. So you know, if you heard consumer spending, uh, that's what can throw you into a recession. I and mean, we're not anywhere near that yet, but the situation with the, the, um, you know, the uh, trade war with China is, uh, is concerning. That is, that is a threat. The other two, I think, have pretty much uh, we've gotten past. Next slide, please. Uh, again, as I said, just said, the shutdown's ended. The Federal Reserve's changed its stance on interest rate hikes. But the likelihood of more tariffs in a trade war with China appears to have increased. And you can see it in the stock market. The Dow had been at 26,500. Now it's around 25,000. And if the trade war escalates, that's going to go down more. And then that's going to affect Business investment, it's going to affect consumer confidence, it's going to affect um, spending, consumer spending. So that would be a downward spiral. And it's not just the fact that it's not so relevant because many people don't own stocks. It's a barometer to business, and it's a measure of the performance of the economy, and it has an effect on consumer confidence. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's a red flag, and uh, so that is a uh, possible problem. Now, I just want to divert a little bit. Another thing you've been hearing about, I'm sure, is uh, talk of a recession on the horizon, right? Well, economists predict there's going to be, most economists predict there's not going to be a recession. I mean, there's going to be a recession in 2020 or 2021. Maybe I'm just a health economist, but I don't believe that. I'm not one of those economists. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, where's the evidence? You can always point to one economic indicator or another and say, oh, this is a red flag, and so we're going to have a recession. But you have to look at the weight of the evidence. And the weight of the evidence, in my view, is strongly uh, against having a, um, a recession. And the other thing is, a number of these economists have been predicting a, a recession for many years. So if you keep saying that, eventually it's gonna, you're going to be right. right? <laughs> but what, is it, what does it prove? Right? Uh, you know, gloomy predictions in the absence of convincing evidence run the risk of being a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I, you know, I think uh, one of the easiest things for economists to do is gloom and doom. But when you read about an economist who's got, you know, trying to sell, selling a book and there's gloom and doom, I would look at that very skeptically. You know, where is the real, where is the real evidence? And I, I'm just not seeing it. Next slide, please. As I said, recently the majority of economists expect a recession. Uh, the economic recovery has been very long and all recoveries must end. That's true. But why so soon? Why 2020 and 2021? You know, we need, we need some evidence that really points to that. Uh, and again, that's hard to find. Business and consumer confidence are high. 
not just about current economic conditions, but economic conditions going forward. Uh, evidence from the Siena Research uh, Institute suggests that consumer confidence in the New York metropolitan area is at its highest level in more than four years. Uh, and this is true not only for current conditions, but expectations about economic conditions going forward. And in New York State, plans to make major purchases like auto and homes as of December 2018 were at their highest levels in more than four years as well. So, you know, where is the evidence to back up these predictions of a recession uh, in the near term? So, there's, I think, a lot of cause to be optimistic. The unemployment rate has been consistently low. Business conditions are favorable. Inflation is nowhere in sight. Now, this doesn't say anything about how it gets distributed. We know that the distribution of income is, is highly skewed. It's been getting more skewed nationally for years, and that also is a problem. That's, that's a problem. Uh, but uh, I don't think that's a, a, a problem that by it, in and of itself is going to cause a recession. So, so why the pessimism? Well, <coughs> the major reason seems to be that because the recovery's been so long, it must end soon. But why? Again, no evidence. In the absence of that evidence, uh, it's, this is, I think this is counterproductive. Uh, it seems unwise to worry about until there's good reasons to emerge, or as my little niece once remarked to her big brother when they were on their way to the doctor, he was crying about it, Jeff, don't cry until it hurts. So, you know, don't worry about a recession until we have real evidence of it. Or it could be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Next slide, please. Now, we do have a number of challenges. Uh, one of the biggest ones is the real estate sector. There's the um, results we've been seeing in the real estate sector have been kind of bizarre from an economist's perspective because we believe the forces of supply and demand determine price and quantity. Uh, uh, very recently, after months of declining year-over-year -year sales in Nassau and Suffolk County, uh, home sales have shown some, some improvement. Uh, home sales declined modestly. I'm sorry, that should be April. Uh, Year-over sales, they, they declined modestly. They, home sales increased modestly in, in April. Year-over-year -year sales rose by 4.4% in Nassau County, and sales grew by 7.2% in Suffolk. Housing sales prices also rose uh, from 522 to 538,000 in Nassau, and home prices rose by 5.6% in Suffolk. Now we see Suffolk, uh, the average prices, as we know, are considerably lower in Suffolk. If we get rapid train transportation to the city, uh, those price that price differential will decline. Uh, no, I, um, I, I'm still on the same slide. And, and the, other, the other thing is residential inventories rose 15%. So what we're seeing is, and this has been going on for a long time, the inventory. We're seeing more and more inventory coming onto the market. And you would think, as the supply increases, I tell my uh, intro economic students, as supply increases, then that says the price should go down and the quantity purchase should go up. We're not finding that. What we're finding is, uh, <clears throat> as the um, supply increases, sales are going down and prices are going up. So what's the explanation? Well, we can talk about theorists, what we have to say, but we can also talk to good real estate agents. And they say, and I agree, is that people are just holding the line on the prices. They're holding the line. They're not, they're not going to come down in price. They'd rather just, just wait it out. And so if that's the case, you'll see prices going up over time, but that's just going to be for a smaller or smaller amount of houses. You get more inventory, prices going up, and uh, sales going down. Right? So it's sort of a game of chicken between uh, buyers and sellers right now. The buyers aren't willing to come down in price, uh, but uh, I mean the sellers aren't willing to come down in price. More and more inventory is coming onto the market because over time, People have to put their house on the market for various reasons. Uh, and demand is going down in terms of the sales. So you know, the, the buyers are really waiting for the price to come down to really make a big move. And the sellers aren't willing to have it. And the only houses that are selling are the ones that the sellers get the price increase that they want, which is why we're in this weird situation. Now making it worse is um, the cap on the deductibility of property taxes and mortgage interest rates, because what that does is nothing but raise the price of uh, housing even further. Uh, and so that's another, another headwind in the real estate sector. And the real estate sector, I mean, for, for most people, real estate, your, pro your home is your most important asset. And you know, if, if the market's weak, 
uh, that's going to threaten, again, your confidence and your investment in, in your home and improvements and so forth. OK, next slide, please. Another problem, challenge with uh, on Long Island is apartment space. It's very scarce. Uh, the vacancy rate's typically around 2%, which is like pretty much full. And the rents are not low. So uh, in terms of rents paid by Long Island millennials, the median rent has been uh, ticking up over a year, almost uh, $1,800. Next slide, please. Uh, no. No, those are, those are actual dollars. Yeah. Uh, and if we look at Long Island nationally compared to New York State and the US, yes, uh, it's expensive, right? So the um, median home price in 2017 was almost twice as high on Long Island as in the US and uh, elsewhere in New York State, upstate New York. Next slide, please. And we have declining millennial wages, yet increasing costs. This is a problem because uh, <clears throat> uh, the demographic projections are that younger people, working age people, but who are younger, uh, are going to be leaving the island because it's too expensive to live here and job opportunities are better elsewhere. So this is not, this is not uh, a, good, a good picture. So we see that um, median wage, median monthly rent, and median home prices on Long Island in 2016, uh, <clears throat> uh, we see that the wages uh, are declining, at least in real terms, and monthly rent is up, and median home price is way up. So this is, this is not a good pattern. And it predicts things like what, what are changes over time in the percent of young adults living with their parents. Right? If the wage opportunities are going down, and if the housing costs are going way up, there's going to be more people staying with their parents. And you know, this is probably a temporary situation. And they'll maybe look for a job off the island where they can have their own home. Uh, next slide, please. OK. So uh, one implication of this pattern is declining household information uh, uh, formation. So home ownership among 25 to 34-year-olds on Long Island, the percent of those who own their own home uh, has decreased from 68% in 1970 to under 21% in 2016. Yeah. And the 20% home ownership rate compares with 30.2% nationally for the same age group. So uh, elsewhere, there's been declines, but not as dramatically as on the island. Next slide, please. Uh, and this, is, um, the, this uh, chart shows uh, Long Island millennials, the percent 25 to 34, who are heads of households versus non-heads of households. Now, if we go back to 1970, if we go back to 1970, we see that in this age group, over 86% of this age group was a head of a household. Uh, but now, we see that 63.5% um, are not heads of household, and only 36.5% are heads of household. Okay. So home ownership and, and, and uh, apartment rentals are declining, and heads of household, uh, the percent in this age group is, is declining. Next slide, please. Uh, so here, uh, as a result of these forces, we're seeing a dramatic increase in the percent of 25 to 34-year-olds living with their parents on Long Island. In 1970, less than 10% of that age group lived with their parents. And by 2016, it was 44.4%. And the national average is only 16%. Right? So this is, a, this is a serious issue. And it relates to the wage uh, patterns. It wage, relates to the cost of housing. It relates to inadequate apartment space, especially affordable apartment space. It's nice that we're getting, we're seeing some more projects, apartments getting built, but you know, when those apartments go for three or $4,000, um, it's not gonna, it's, those aren't entry apartments. Those aren't entry level apartments. Okay, next slide, please. So, uh, the uh, change in demographics has been tracked by uh, the Long Island Association Research Institute for a number of years. Uh, Here's what the Research Institute found in terms of birth rates. Between 2000 and 2016, the total number of births on Long Island fell from 37 to 29,000, an almost 20% decline. Uh, in 2001, there were approximately 14,000 more births than deaths on Long Island. By 2016, the increase um, had fallen to only 5,600. Fertility rates on the decline. Uh, basically, Long Island is aging. Okay? And in fact, 
the groups aged 45 to 64 is going to be increasing over the next 10 years. And the younger group, uh, aged uh, 25 to 34, uh, to 44, is going to be decreasing. And this, this will, oh, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. 45 to 64 is going to be decreasing, 65 and over is increasing. And this is a problem. Why? Because uh, the highest wage earners are in the 45 to 64 range. And the 65 and over are going to require more medical more medical care. So we're going to have an increase in medical care and less ability to support it. So these demographics, demographics take a long time to really kick in. But when they kick in, they also take, they have big effects and they take a long time to change and reverse. So it's like, you know, big ship. It takes a long time to turn. But once it's turned, you know, that's been a big change. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Well, I think this is redundant with what I've just said. And I just want to, want to move on. Um, Ah, so now we're segueing into um, Brookhaven. I, I want to talk a little bit about patterns and federal funding for research and development. Uh, these are key components of the Long Island economy, Brookhaven National Lab, Gold Spring Harbor, universities and colleges. So this is a big deal uh, for all of those uh, institutions. Next slide, please. And we just look at some trends uh, in federal funding for R&D. So these are um, R&D by different... Uh, uh, component over time. So we see the total R&D has been um, <clears throat> has been really trending downward since the uh, Great Recession. Uh, and we see that uh, most dramatically in terms of, um, let's see, a decline in uh, development. Uh, applied research has been pretty flat. Uh, basic research has been pretty flat. Uh, so it's mostly the big decline seems to be in, in development, and uh, you know it's, it's gone down from uh, what by 2009 it was 77, 77, uh, 100, 77 down to 51. In th these are in thousands of dollars, so 77 million thousands of dollars. <laughs> okay, next slide. But different areas have fared differently, so. Uh, if we look at all locations, research and development by state and other locations, now we're in millions of dollars here. And we see that in terms of all locations, there's been a slight downward trend. Uh, California's been having a downward trend. Maryland has done better than increasing. Maybe proximity to uh, D.C. Uh, is helpful. I don't know. Uh, New York has been flat. Right? See, it's almost the same. No change. And these are not... Um, Inflation adjusted. So there's been real, actually real declines. Right. Next slide. Now, on to Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, it's an, obviously an important component of Long Island's economy. Let's try to quantify that a little bit. It's, it's important both in terms of physical capital and what we economists call human capital, right? which is the, the, uh, the brainiacs. And I'll briefly summarize the results of a recent study I worked with uh, colleagues at BNL uh, on the, uh, the impact of uh, Brookhaven on the New York State economy, particularly Long Island, uh, for the years 2018 and 19. And to do that, we use something called input-output analysis uh, to quantify these outcomes, the increase in the value of the output due to Brookhaven National Lab, the increase in earnings, the number of jobs supported per annually by uh, Brookhaven. Uh, in addition to these aggregate outcomes, uh, outputs, earnings, and jobs, um, the study also quantified uh, different spending centers like construction and non-construction, utilities, wages, visiting scientists. So the whole report breaks it down into components. But here I'm going to summarize the overall results. And we also summarize the um, impact of this economic growth to tax revenues in New York State. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little bit of background on how this works. Uh, the, uh, that is the input-output model. Uh, it quantifies ec economic activity within a region. So it captures what each business or sector has to purchase from every other uh, <coughs> sector to produce a dollar's worth of goods or services. So it consists of three components, direct, indirect, and induced. Now, what are those? Direct is just the direct spend. What does Brookhaven National Lab spend on wages? That's the direct. Indirect would be the spending that Brookhaven does supports businesses. And those businesses have to, will, do, will increase spending. 
So, for example, if someone were to buy a new car, right, uh, you buy the car, the dealer says, well, now my inventory is down, so I have to order a new car from the, from the uh, manufacturer. So that's how that spend on that initial car generates additional spending. Okay? And the, in, uh, the induced effects are the effects from the wage earners at, at Brookhaven National Lab. They don't put all their money under a mattress. Right? You go out and spend it. Right? So these direct and indirect and induced effects are captured by multipliers, what we call multipliers. And they are, they are developed from regional input-output tables that are produced by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Uh, the multipliers determine economics where an increase in spending produces an increase in total output greater than the initial amount of spent. Uh, and that, that occurs because, you know, the initial spending income, the initial spending is income for other groups. So Brookhaven spends on, your, on, the, on its workers, and of course that's income for the workers, and they spend that. So the multipliers will show the total effect on economic activity resulting from a project or the spending patterns of an institution like Brookhaven. So, for example, a project that cost, might cost a million dollars could generate economic output of 1.8 million once indirect and induced effects are added to the 1 million cost of the project itself. Uh, and as I said before, there are several measures of changes in economic activity that one can estimate through these multipliers, uh, which are gross output, earnings, and employment. Uh, and sales and income tax revenues are calculated by applying the relevant sales and, tax, um, and state tax income rates to the value of earnings generated. Okay, next slide. So, the economic impacts of Brookhaven National Lab on Long Island's economy are, are large in terms of output. BNL increases the value of output by $637 million in 2018 and $612 million in 2019. Uh, construction and non-construction spending and wages paid to workers have the largest effects. Earnings, the value of earnings is estimated to be $560 million in 2018 and $561 million in 2019. And jobs, BNL's presence on Long Island adds 4,700, supports 4,763 jobs in 2018. Of these, 4,300 were supported on Long Island, 40, 456 in the rest of New York State. And in 2019, it's estimated that 4,879 jobs will be supported, of which almost 4,700 are on Long Island. Uh, tax revenues, the economic activity generated by BNL increases sales and income tax revenue in New York State we estimate by 71 million in 2018 and 72 million in 2019. Next slide, please. So, to summarize, Long Island's economy is strong, but the real estate sector lags behind. Significant concern because that's the most valuable asset for most people. And cuts in R&D spending pose a threat to Long Island's development as a leading center of excellence in technology and research. And the high cost of living and lack of affordable apartment space may lead to an exit of Long Island's younger labor force and an aging population will impose increased health care costs, but with potentially less resources to pay for them. On a lighter note, BNL is a major contributor to Long Island's economy in terms of increasing output, earnings, job creation, and helping generate more tax revenues. Um, next slide. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Well, I mean, that's that's well. I, I guess you could look at, uh, you know, neighborhoods that. Um, well, it's easier to think of neighborhoods that uh, went down and didn't come back. I'm thinking of uh, the Rust Belt uh, cities, uh, but you know, you could, maybe you could think about neighborhoods in Manhattan that once were prosperous and then they became uh, poor and then they were gentrified with, with yuppies. So, you know, certain seg segments of, um, of uh, Brooklyn have beautiful brownstone, right? And once upon a time they were expensive and then in some of these neighborhoods they became poor neighborhoods and now they're, they're gentrified. So, you know, there are certainly examples of that. Now, if you look at Queens, that's a more difficult situation because Queens was never really a wealthy community and the architecture reflects it. So if you want to, if you want to gentrify Queens, you've got to do teardowns, right? 
But you know, with Brooklyn, you always had you had those um, you had those uh, uh, brownstones, and so if you go through a decline, it was easier to rebound. Harlem is rebounding as well, and they also have beautiful architecture in many of their neighborhoods. And you know, once upon a time, it was a wealthier neighborhood. Then it declined. Now it's gentrifying. Yeah, so they do turn around. Mm hmm Yeah. Yes. Mm hmm Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, you know, I think there's um I don't want to say this diplomatically. Go ahead. Sure. It needs to be ramped up, but there's also there's the NIMBY factor, right? Like if you're putting in regulations where you have to have at least an acre of land, what you're really saying is, we don't want that group in our community. And the problem is, uh, that might make life better for you in the short run, but it makes everyone worse off in the long run because the demographics, as I've shown you, are very unfavorable long term for Long Island. And, and a, a big part of that is really ramping up affordable housing. Absolutely. No, it, it has to be. We have to have political leadership to make it happen. Yeah. 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 I think with department space, that's a very good, very good point. A certain part of it, percent, has to be dedicated to lower income housing, more affordable housing. Um, my brother in law is in Chicago, he has an apartment uh, in, that's mixed like that. And it's really, really a very nice development. I mean, it works really well. Um, and we just need that on a much larger scale here. Because the new apartment space, if you look at the price of apartment space on Long Island by age, there's a dramatic increase in the price of the average price of newer apartments built within the, the past five or 10 years, let's say. And that's not what we really need. If we're going ha to have those apartments, we have to have a certain percent dedicated to having lower income space as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, these are, I can tell you that the prices of the new apartments are, you know, 3,000, 4,000. In Port Jefferson, where I live, those apartments are filled, and they're filled at those prices. Um, <clears throat> those aren't prices that uh, are entry level. I, I think they're people, no, I think they're people who are downsizing. Uh, a, a friend of mine went, remarked that, um, oh, that's where the divorced men live, and their wives have uh, the house and, you know, Mount Sinai, I, I, you know, I, I'm just relaying what was said to me. I don't know if there's any truth to that at all. But I know that they're not millennials moving in there. Yes. Yeah, relatively. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, my pleasure.
No, no. I, well, yeah, it's a good question. So multipliers change with economic conditions. So if you look at the multiplier from the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis that applied to the period, say, 2008, they're going to be lower than the multipliers that, that I used. Um, but that said, multiplier, many of the multipliers often fall within the range of you know, 1.7 to 1.8 or 1.9. So it's not surprising that the ratios aren't all that different. Well, different areas are going to have, I, I would, I'm guessing uh, rural Oklahoma is going to have lower multipliers than, than we have here. I haven't really looked at all those regions. I've focused on Long Island and New York State, but um, I'm sure undoubtedly they vary uh, across geographic areas. But it, I don't think it's going to be the case that if the manufacturing multiplier uh, on Long Island is 1.8, it's going to be 1.1 in Oklahoma. It might be 1.5 or 1.4. Well, you know, the big, the big challenge to, to new businesses here is, is finding workers, because finding the right workers, because the market is really tight right now. So I think that's, that's one of the things. I mean, but as, pro as problems go, that's a good problem to have, right? I mean, if that's your biggest problem, I mean, it's better than having no demand. Demand is, is strong. Confidence is strong. Businesses want to invest. They are, I mean, I'm hearing stories where, you know, uh, there'll be tw an engineering company will have 20 openings. And they just can't find the qualified people in sufficient numbers. Yeah. Third job problem. Yeah. The asset question. Yeah. A lot of this stuff I saw in the news was focused on the education system. Yes. The WMP system and the Institute of Economic Development and the yes. Department of Economic Management. Mm -hmm. Do you think that would be a positive problem to access it not only because of Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think third track's a very important initiative, and I think it all works together. It works together in terms of lowering uh, the time to get to and from New York City. Uh, it, it will raise real estate values on Long Island, um, and uh, it's, I think it's, it's a win. Young people who want to live in, I mean, it's transportation. Young people who want to live in the city, it makes it feasible for them. On the other hand, people who want to move out of the city, maybe they work in the city, but they want to live in a bigger house, and they want to have, you know, they have a family and so forth. It works for them too. So, you know, tra transportation, uh, rail transportation also is something that has to be really ramped up. Um, I know it interferes with some neighborhoods. I know it costs a lot of money. But from the long term perspective, uh, if we want to reverse those demographics, which are really 10 years from now going to be quite a bit worse than they are now, uh, you've got to make those investments. Yeah, I, I think I think I think Long Island's a, a wealthy community. Uh, it's aging. People want to stay on Long Island. People, you know, they can maybe have a nice house, but they want to downsize. They can afford a nice apartment. And you know, uh, look, uh, these companies who are building these expensive apartments—they're not bad. They're trying to make a profit, right? But we need, I think, some kinds of regulations that says, okay, you can make this profit, but 30%. Of all the apartment space you have to make has to be entry level apartment space. Because that is in the interest of the whole the whole community. Yeah. Sure. No, I mean people will pay for expensive apartments. I mean, the, the vacancy rate on uh, as I said is two percent uh, for apartment space on Man on, uh, Long Island. So that's very low. So yes. You add more apartment space, you build it, they will come. And you build expensive ones, which are going to give you a higher margin, they'll come. So you, on, on your own, you don't have the incentive as a profit-maximizing firm to say, well, I just want to build you know, smaller apartments and more affordable because I'll still make enough money and I, I'm, I'm just so nice. Right? That's, as, a, as a shareholder, I wouldn't want a firm to behave that way. What we have to do is set up responsible regulations. We have to set, define the rules of the game 
in such a way that they have the incentive to invest. It's still profitable for them, but it serves a, a, a greater purpose, which is you know reversing that that the alarming demographic trend we're facing. Oh yeah, sure, of course. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, to what extent depends depends on uh, the concept my economic students love. Not it depends on the price elasticity of demand for housing, which means you know if the ability to pass on a price increase depends on how much the consumer demands it. I mean, if if uh, <coughs> you you want you if the elasticity is low, that means that you want that apart. You're willing to pay more for it. You're not going to you're not going to, um, the demand will be there. Uh, it's something you really feel you have to have. In that case, it's easy to pass on the price increase. On the other hand, if price is very elastic, it's not so easy. This is one of the problems that the service sector has because, uh, you know, leisure and hospitality, because um, this is discretionary spending. We don't have to eat at restaurants, right? So it's harder for them to pass on price increases. But in manufacturing, you know, you do need a, you do need a, a refrigerator or a stove. Right, so that's, that's demand for that is is uh, is uh, less is less elastic, and then of course for medical care, hospital care, it's very inelastic. You know, no one goes to the hospital because it's fun or they want to, but when they have to go, they have to go. Yeah. Oh, no, that no, no, that doesn't capture that. Yeah, yeah, illegal. Right, right. That that isn't capture. Yeah. Of course, they're gonna, of course, that, that's that's why we're in the situation we are in. Because it's not. I mean, it's one thing to propose something that would would help this issue, right? But then there are competing issues, and you have to come together and weigh the costs and the benefits, and 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 make a decision that's in the overall best interest. Of course, that doesn't often happen. I'm just an economist. I'm not a politician. I can't. <laughs> I can't solve that problem. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also a lot of a longer commute. I mean, a lot of those people are going to buy the 450. They're going to have a longer commute, but they're willing to do it because that's that's quite a that's quite a quite a savings. Having long commutes, I think so. And now, if we have better rail transportation, uh, then those prices the 450 will go up, and there'll be more people coming out here. But um, you know, one of the models we don't see it here. This is what I would hate to see happen here. Uh, in the D.C. area, they have these like all these townhouses and apartments, and they're almost like towns unto themselves. And then they have stores and a post office. And I had a friend who lived there once. And I said, "Well, you know, you live in I call this fake town because it's not really a downtown. It's sort of a fake downtown in the sense that it just supports that that uh, area." And so he said, "No, we have all this. So we have." A, you know, a movie theater, we have a wine bar. Let me take you out to the wine bar. We'll have a glass of wine and everything. And uh, so I said, I've, we had this glass of wine. And I said, well, you know, it was about 8 o'clock. And I said, you know, if you want a second glass of wine, you, you better order it now. He said, well, it's only 8 o'clock. I said, yes, but this is fake town. It's going to close. And sure enough, we got a last call at like 8.30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think tax deductions uh, on kids, are, it's going to help more if you have a lot of kids. But <laughs> you have, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
I said, well, it, you know, it depends on the empty. Some empty nesters can afford retirement in a nice uh, apartment complex in, on Long Island, and others have to go elsewhere, depending on their, their circumstances. I, I don't see that as a huge effect. No. Yeah. Is what, I'm sorry, is what? Oh, I, I haven't looked at that carefully, but at my senses it's been fairly flat. Yeah. But I understand you're in a growth phase, so it could be ramped up. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, the, the tax, yeah, the, um, yeah, uh, the tax breaks, I, I think that's had some modest success, but I don't think it's been, I mean, I, I don't think that's been a big driver, so far at least. It could be depending on, depending on how, how big the deductions are and how long they'll, you know, you could make it one, but I, I think so far it hasn't been such a big, such a big driver. And they also have, um, you know, tax incentives for um, particular industries like, pharma and things like that, and you know, small, small companies getting them to come out here. And I think there's been some success, but I don't think that's been a big, uh, it hasn't been what we'd hoped so far. I mean, I, I think it'd be great if you just get, I mean, there's all these big pharmaceutical companies headquartered in New Jersey. If we could just get one of them to come over here, uh, it would be a great thing, but that's not. I think, it, yeah, absolutely.